It has been said that to gain the world carries with it a most exorbitant cost. A price that also brings with the acquisition an almost mythological set of accounts. Yet, on the other side of this transaction, it may be asked, what is it to lose the world? If indeed there has been an arrangement to acquire a certain external construct which could be called the world, is it a bargain, or is it a very regrettable deal? These questions are not presented for those content with fulfilling egotistical desires and goals that are advertised with feverish delight to a populace in love with its own reflection. It should be obvious by now that there very much is a broad way in which it is incredibly easy to follow, and inversely a narrow way, which is the most difficult path that any individual can take. To follow the crowd is to gain the world, and to follow the heart is to lose it. It is furthermore not so easy to just say that following one's heart, so to speak, is to bring one on the correct course of anything. It must be noted that the heart as it currently is in man and woman has been twisted into a labyrinth by the desires of the mind, the mind that is filled with vanity, cruelty, and selfishness. To even begin listening to the heart at its essence is to be able to completely quash the ceaseless barrage of noise from the mind which has falsely taken up the crown of the kingdom of man. The mind is rich. It builds up for itself stores upon stores of cherished treasures, and this makes one an emperor of notions, which includes the stores of beliefs and judgments against everything imaginable. How can anyone know themselves with such a horde of subjective weight constantly clamoring to be heard? For who can then comprehend that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than the rich man to enter into the kingdom of God? The mind can be of great service, but it is a most deadly master, and it is in this position that it has taken its place. Man has gained the world which is the mind which is time, and has lost the heart. If one should acquire the world, this makes the heart heavy with desire as satisfaction is never acquired. There is always more to accumulate. The earth becomes heavy, and this weight becomes the burden of the ages, which can be a cycle that is repeated endlessly. The scales of the father are never in balance, and therefore the pendulum of time ever swings back and forth. How relevant, then, that the term father carries within its lettered arrangement the name earth as well. Thus, to gain the world makes one's heart heavy, and the kingdom within cannot be attained. How could it? How can all these weights be dragged through a passage whereby the only way to go through is to carry nothing at all? The ego is far too wide to fit through. Judgment and petty emotions are far too wide to fit through. Attachments of all kinds are far too wide to fit through. The incessant noise of the mind with all of its goals and ambitions is far too wide to fit through. Ideas of competition, division, superiority, fame, fortune, and status are all far too wide to fit through. Desire has been falsely crowned, and it is far too wide to go through. All of these are endless drama-filled chases in the circular human race that goes nowhere except back onto itself. The mind perpetually seeks after glory over others, which is so obvious that no examples need to be given. It dominates the headlines. This need to attain glory further exacerbates the central issues that plague man, since to achieve this self-satisfaction, one must run the human race with feverish enthusiasm. The individual must run one's heart out, all the way to their personal finish line. It is the divided, contradictory, and morose mind that sends the orders which commands the heart to do its bidding. The heart, as prisoner, is left with but little choice except to obey the demands that are placed upon it. It must be asked again, from where did these ideas originate? Were they originated within that deepest place of the individual that is untouched by any external factors? Or is so much derived from influence, conditioning, and external mental governance? Does the individual carry even one completely uninfluenced original thought within their mind? If this be so, that there is no originality, 
It is not difficult to surmise that each of us simply become copies of a program to serve the agenda of a machine that does not have our best interests at heart. It is in the best interest of this machine to beguile and coax each individual into believing that all of their thoughts and ideas are their own. Is this not obvious? Who wants to believe that they are simply a copy? A carbon copy among so many carbon-based copies, programmed and designed to ensure a generalized flow of energy in a singular direction. This doesn't serve the ego, so this observation is scoffed at and dismissed, so the individual can carry on in the direction that fate has already laid out for them. When the eyes clamor for the goals of the external, they see no reason to turn within, and thus they continue to follow paths that are wide and well-trodden. On the other side of the coin are those that believe that a personal savior has already walked amongst them, paid the price for the debt of acquiring the world, and that the only effort needed from the individual to enter the kingdom within is to believe in this symbolic savior. This exonerates the individual from personal responsibility and absolves them from needing to put in any effort to make any changes whatsoever within themselves. This set of beliefs thus turns the narrow gate into a very wide one indeed. There is, of course, a very large difference between believing in someone as opposed to believing in what they are trying to inform you of. This premise has been stated many times before because it is of vital importance. No one can dispute that there is genuine benevolence and a willingness in some to freely offer guidance or assistance with practically any situation. That much is obvious. But guidance should have never been mistaken for ultimate salvation without personal application. This error has furthermore led to the development of the same psychology that puts faith in governments that promise salvation in exchange for an equitable loss in freedom. Religion and politics, which includes government, are very much synonymous with one another for this reason, among many others. The lesson being that when one is willing to hand over their internal authority to another in exchange for protection or salvation, they in turn lose their freedom through that exchange. One must, therefore, learn to carry their own weight, so to speak. The good news in all of this is that it should be obvious, in an esoteric sense, that there has always been guidance. There have always been the messengers who are willing to be killed to bring forth the same message. The better news is that when one is able to turn off the mental noise and become silent, that guidance is already within each of us. It always has been. The exchange of freedom for protection, along with all of its repercussions, is being rolled out script-like in a manner that is unprecedented in modern history. Those who are choosing freedom are seen as the enemy of those who are choosing protection, and this is creating a great divide in humanity. Choosing sides, it is logically seen, is quite a dualistic action, since it favors one side over the other. This is, quite unfortunately, simply how this act is being presented. Freedom is never a choice to those who exist in the heart. It is our very essence. Many have just decided to forget this, or ignore it. Our true essence would never wish in any circumstance to grant privileged exclusivity for some with disadvantaged restriction for others, simply because of a choice made in regard to one's own body. Tactics of coercive compliance are mendacious methods of manipulation used to put a strain on the minds of those who are in alignment with freedom and instead try to forcefully direct these minds towards compliance. In a populace locked down by their own fear and demanding protection, there is apparently no mercy for those who align themselves with the heart and with freedom. In any other circumstance, the behavior of governments and the public that agrees with coercive measures would be described as being oppressive, terrorizing, and dictatorial. 
In other words, bullying. But the script has reversed, and anyone who orients themselves with freedom is viewed as a threat. An individual that doesn't care for the welfare of others because they are not begging for protection, which is offered as a free Trojan horse as delivered by pharmaceutical companies through the propaganda arms of mainstream media, big tech, and government. It is noteworthy to point out that the term pharmaceutical is also an anagram for cephalic trauma, with cephalic being the Latin for head. Thus, the head becomes the target for an industry that is hell-bent on creating as much mental trauma as possible, while the populace at large is filling up with seething anger and resentment at those who are not begging for freedom-destroying protections from that same industry and the governments of the world. Insults are thrown, and the division grows ever wider by the day. This construct is exactly synonymous with the religious concept that if one believes in the Savior, they will be redeemed and find their place in heaven, and the non-believers will be damned to hell. Those who believe in the vaccine are going to heaven, which is being touted as a return to normal life, while the so-called anti-vaxxers will be damned to hell and cast out of society. It may not seem like it, but if there is to be a one-world religion, this is certainly the template for it. The external reflects the internal and vice versa. As within, so without. It is only a dark and nefarious mind that concocts such a dishonorable scheme to further segregate a species that has already had so much division in its history. That being said, it is the mind that is doing this, and not the true master within each of us which could never imagine creating these scenarios. Many think these plots are a little far-fetched, and that nothing like it can happen, or will ever happen. Though that is an idealistic thought, the trajectory and pattern of what is occurring unfortunately does not agree with this premise, which should be observationally obvious by now. Yet, why compare the inner sanctuary to the chaotic external world? Isn't this all just a game? Why be bothered with any of it? The paradox is that the inner and outer worlds are constantly converging. The real and the unreal, light and dark, the truth and the lie. It is far more difficult to face a terrible truth than it is to believe in a beautiful lie, which is why the liar is encouraged and the one pointing towards the truth is crucified. This is the way it has been since time began, and to the really attentive, there are very few signs that it's changing in the grand scheme of things. When a person only sticks to others that are like-minded, it may appear that great leaps and bounds are being made to change the direction that the external world is heading towards. But as soon as one steps outside of this terrain, it is quite obvious that this is quite unfortunately not the case. There is still so much blindness, so much egotism, a pitchfork in hand willingness of the fear-driven public to throw anyone under the bus who does not comply with the self-appointed authorities. It must be noted here that there is a big difference between pessimism and blind optimism. To be neutral is to instead focus on what is, to the best of one's ability. In the same regard, it can be acknowledged that this whole reality is a game, whereby the pessimist gives up entirely on it, while the blind optimist waits for a promised savior that will never come, or is already here but acts as the false messiah in the form of those who are in charge. The one that goes beyond this duality places themselves upon the path of what could be called perfect action. But what does this mean exactly? It is action that is not defined by the peculiarities of division, which is the property of choice. The mind is systematic, and every action stemming from it needs a thought-out plan or set of reasons for being carried out. The heart, on the other hand, simply does without any interval of time. The action is immediate and is always correct. But what exactly is correct? It very much seems that every action taken by anyone could lead to a debate about whether or not it was correct, which would also depend on the factor of perspective. Was the action only correct for the person taking it? Who else was affected by it? Was any harm done? The line of questioning for any single action can be endless, which presents a grand conundrum. From this understanding, can it be understood how politics also plays an endless chase towards a better situation, with each formation of government not quite satisfying the needs of everyone? If only this person were in office, things would be so much better, it is consistently stated. 
That's the game. So what the individual is left with is that one either plays into it or becomes an observer of it. But does this mean that as an observer, that the individual no longer takes action of any kind? This obviously cannot be the case, since action is constant. What is being brought to attention is where our actions are being derived from. It is a fact that there is a game, and it is a fact that each of us is in this game, whether we like it or not. What prisoner wants to admit that they are imprisoned and being treated unfairly? It is good to see beyond the game, to say that there is no such thing as time, and that one should not get caught in the illusions. But the fact still remains. I am here, and I must face what is. This is often difficult to do for one main reason. Pain. It is painful to see things as they are. It is painful to connect the dots which shatter the lies. It is painful to carry fear about what the future might bring. So, rather than face the pain, it has always been easier to go into a state of denial, to fall into the illusion that our captors are hired to protect us from that pain, so long as we are willing to play along. It is obvious that anyone who has tried to push back against their captivity is always met by a force that puts them back in line. In this regard, to walk the path of the narrow gate makes one an internal conscientious objector. It is to object not just to the external state, but to the status of so much internal chaos that has been in service to the state. Man talks about love as if it's an emotion or something that can be divided through certain attachments. But where there is any kind of division, there cannot be love which is why concepts such as nationalism or love of one's country are falsehoods built upon the foundations of ideas given to mankind by those who rule over them. These ideas are the foundations which wars are built upon. Love as a pure quality is a paradox. There is either love for all, or there is no love. It is absolutist, with everything falling in between being a form of division. This is heard by the mind as being absurd and a bunch of rubbish, something that is impossible to attain. How can anyone become an example of love absolute? But the mind has not listened to that voice which speaks from the chambers of the abyss, a voice belonging to the source of our being which is unable at its essence to hold hatred for anything. Where there is hatred, judgment, envy, pride, or egotism, there is no love. Where there is no love, there cannot be freedom. Everyone has heard that love is the answer, but that solution is never found by anyone that carries the baggage that blocks the narrow gate. There is also great frustration at hearing all of this. In anger or even resentment, a person may yell and scream, Tell us what to do! What is the exact solution to take us away from all of these problems and to get us out of this situation? The rulers give the populace religion to placate this anger, and this works for most people. This is meaningless for those who see through it. Telling those who see beyond the religious facade to work on dropping the ego and the internal baggage is, however, just as meaningless. This is because the mind is results-driven. To see is to believe. Individuals want to witness some kind of transformation taking place especially in themselves, or at the very least in another. Create a demonstration, and then we will believe you and follow you. Again, it will be stated, follow and subscribe to no one, for no one holds eternal truth. So, what would a demonstration even look like? Is it a magical incantation that if spoken will open up a gateway that one walks through to another dimension of freedom? Perhaps, as has been hoped, if only enough people would wake up, then things would somehow just get better and the world of mankind would cease to be governed. Or maybe it will take a perfectly written letter to the Vatican that reclaims one's sovereignty and soul. Even if any of these or a myriad of other solutions actually worked, the central premise is not being looked at. How much egotism inside of oneself is still being carried? How much prejudice? How much hubris. Imagine for a moment the idea of a perfectly written letter handed over to the right authority being the solution. 
This perfectly written letter is made public, which is then accessible to everyone. Murderers, rapists, racists, bigots, fascists, charlatans, oppressors, and so on. Each of these types of people, filled with so much that is profane, now has access to a perfectly worded letter which creates a gateway that leads to the inner kingdom. Everyone who wants access now goes through without doing a single thing to change how they are inside of themselves. What does that kingdom begin to look like after a short while? Would it not just be the same situation all over again that so many here are wishing to escape from? Again, it must be said that there have always been messengers and there have always been guides, but the crucifixion of the messengers by the populace is a message in and of itself. If everyone should be handed the keys to the kingdom, it renders the kingdom to a state of meaninglessness. Salvation by its very nature is a very personal problem. No one else can force the ego out of you. No one else can force hatred, competition, envy, lust, and desire out of you. These are elements that have been acquired for a host of reasons, and they are elements that each of us needs to neutralize on our own. There are no magic wands for such things. The tools required are simple. Observation and intention, which if done sincerely can eventually lead to the mastery of oneself over these constructs. This is what is meant by the phrase, know thyself. The body, just like the soul, is the symbol for the kingdom, which is why what is going on at this current point in the external story is extremely important. When measures of coercion are used to inflict pressure to take into one's kingdom a foreign substance with a consequence that one will not be able to be a participating member of society unless receiving said foreign substance, it sets one up for the acceptance of tyranny at another level. This idea of the greater good is one that is extremely dangerous, for who is defining the greater good? Is it some enlightened master? Are establishment scientists or medical professionals the final authority about this definition of the greater good? Is one supposed to put ultimate trust in another simply because they are told to do so? This brings into view the aspect of reliance. The system has been created and organized in such a way that more often than not, even when one is not in alignment to the mandates of the system, they are still reliant upon it. This creates a very serious problem, since one is more apt to eventually relinquish their stance of conscientious objection to ensure their ability to exist within a system that they have become dependent upon. Since at this point, the world authorities are priming themselves into the position of saying that they will not take no for an answer, it will eventually be stated that if one does not like the measures that the system is imposing on the individual, then the individual needs to leave it. At a certain point in this regard, it will become quite obvious as to who will be walking the walk and who will have simply talked the talk in regards to the personal lines in the sand that they have drawn. Alignment with one's words and actions is always of critical importance, and the greatest tests of this cannot exclude the physical realm. This is why what humanity is experiencing at this moment is a tremendous opportunity but also a terrifying juncture. The opportunity is to see if one could go beyond their fears, while the juncture is a moment that defines whether one is able to stand alone in what they know is correct, as opposed to being influenced by the crowd. But there are also many factors and circumstances to consider. What if one is a parent with children, or is taking care of someone who is elderly? What if one has a disability of some kind, or is for one reason or the other, quite literally unable to separate themselves from the system if push comes to shove. What about these kinds of situations? This question brings one back to the statement of what prisoner wants to admit that they truly are imprisoned and being treated unfairly. It is also the reason that no one can give exacting advice to anyone else about what to do in their particular situation. Where would the freedom be in that? However, individual situations do not preclude one from doing esoteric work. Even in hell, one can still find heaven. Sometimes life will put us on the wrong side of the equation, but it's what we do on that side which matters. 
Tyranny is ever taken apart from the inside out. The heart will never condemn anyone because it wants to give everything it has to everyone. And what it has to give is without beginning nor end. What it has to give is beyond what anyone can imagine, and no one has to go anywhere for it. There is nowhere to go. The kingdom is within. It always was and always will be. To stand alone does not mean that one has to utterly be alone or attempt to do everything in isolative solitude. In recognizing the patterns before us, there is a very real possibility that if an individual chooses to not take one of the vaccines currently being administered to the world's population, they will by default be forced out of the system of commerce which the world's controllers have ironically forced nearly every individual to be dependent upon which is obviously the point of why it has been created that way. Of course, this being said, there is always a small chance that by calling them out on this scheme, that it will not come to fruition in exactly the way that they have planned, which is why observation and reporting have always been essential. It has become almost comical that anyone reporting on their agenda has only ever been consistently called a conspiracy theorist. No one can compliment those writing the narrative of the agenda as being altogether very creative. Consistent, yes, but creative, not so much. At the moment, though, it seems that the intention of the world governments is undeviating and targeted at certain agenda points. Compliance of the populace at large is obviously one of these points. It is clear that they desire compliance of any and all measures of infliction put into place and that any who do not comply are at the very least to be shamed and perhaps ultimately ostracized and blacklisted. There is a movie called Gattaca which portrayed this exact scenario we are heading towards where those who are naturally born of God were considered invalid and treated as outcasts while the genetically altered humans were considered valid and were able to participate in all levels of society. There is something going on behind the scenes that is generating the scenario for this to happen on the level of ownership and title which is not being noticed nearly as much. To understand it better is to go back to 2004, where Saskatchewan farmer Percy Schmeiser was taken to court by agrobiotech company Monsanto for illegal use of their patented genetically modified seed. The court actually ruled in favor of Monsanto that Percy Schmeiser did in fact use its seed, but also ruled in favor that Mr. Schmeiser did not have to pay Monsanto its technology use fee. The point of knowing the importance of this story has to do with genetic patents. Fast forward to 2013 and the Supreme Court of the United States hears a case that rules on whether or not human genes can be patented. The court ruled that they cannot be patented because they are a product of nature. However, as is stated, they did allow that DNA manipulated in a lab is eligible to be patented because DNA sequences altered by humans are not found in nature. The court specifically mentioned the ability to patent a type of DNA known as complementary DNA. This synthetic DNA is produced from the molecule that serves as the instructions for making proteins called messenger RNA. This sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? In fact, it sounds exactly like the mRNA gene therapy vaccines which are stated to carry the instructions to make spike proteins, which is simply a diversionary way of telling the public that their intention is to create in the field of human biology complementary DNA, or cDNA for short. Thus, in a legal sense, it wouldn't matter to these companies if these products of industry being injected into people changed the natural formation of DNA in the people being injected with them. What is far more important from a business and legal patent standpoint is that there is now patented cDNA synthetic DNA being created and swimming inside of untold numbers of humans. cDNA which is owned by corporations which gives them grounds to claim ownership over wherever their gene therapy property exists.
This puts them in a potential position to justify forced compliance upon those who carry their legally owned property. As it is said, possession is nine-tenths of the law, and the owner shall have their possession returned to them if taken or used. This manifests the true God complex that these power-hungry de facto rulers possess, while they push to create a society of the accepted whom they own through patent, and the blacklisted who stubbornly choose to remain free. With the new technology called CRISPR, promising genetic alterations including designer babies, along with a combination of genetically modified food and other mutative technologies, this scenario no longer looks like science fiction. The question that many are asking is, what can we do if we don't want to participate in all of this? What if push really does come to shove, and all of a sudden, if I don't take one of these vaccines which makes me a valid member of society, that I'm no longer able to go to work, or even to the grocery store. If I can't go to work, obviously I'm not making money. And if I can't make money, I can't buy food to eat, I eventually lose my house, and so on and so forth. It's a terrible scenario. But it's a scenario that shouldn't be ignored until the very last minute, simply because many do not want it to happen. It is by this scenario that one can comprehend what coercive compliance really means. It presents a false dichotomy one that is based upon fear as a motivator. It is said that you don't have to take the vaccine, but here are the restrictions placed upon you if you choose not to comply. This is not a choice at all. By now it should also be obvious why the powers of this world have worked so hard at suppressing self-sufficiency of all kinds, making it illegal in more and more cases to even grow a garden to supply one's own food. Anyone talking about the concepts of individual sovereignty have also been suppressed to a large extent for the same reason, because there does exist in principle a way for the individual to separate themselves from the external governing system. When done with full force and intent, this however leaves a person completely out in the cold, and there is no coming back from it. For those that say by focusing on these scenarios we end up creating them, are not paying attention to the central premise again. There is a force that has imprisoned our essence which creates these despotic goals. Ignoring the intentions of that force does not magically make the will of that force disappear. Believing in such things has been one of the tragic dangers of falling into the wavelength of new age positive thought circles. For many individuals, not taking this pharmaceutical product is very much a spiritual choice. To succumb to the pressures of taking one of these injections would be spiritually devastating. This cannot be understood and will never be heard by those who yell in your face that you are an idiot who doesn't know how to trust in the science. It is, of course, a sincere hope that this scenario of a blacklisted segment of society does not come to fruition, since the creation of such a divisive choice is not in service to the health and well-being of humanity. However, one is caught in a form of disillusionment to believe that the rulers of this world genuinely and affectionately care for our individual health and well-being. Thus, it is at least better to prepare for such a possibility as opposed to doing nothing. It should be obvious that none of these works have pretended upon the idea of hope, and instead focus upon the facts of patterns and the symbols which correlate with those patterns. The most important work is done internally but the external cannot be ignored. That is simply foolishness. It will be repeated. The internal and the external are constantly converging. What is first and foremost being brought into the open is that there is a different passport to work on attaining. The passport of what has been called neutrality. The passport of the narrow gate. Very few are approved for its use because it's not free and it's not widely available. The price for it is high incredibly so, which is not paid for by any currency used in this world. Are each of us so willing to sell out members of our species, leave them behind so that one can go on a cruise or go to a concert or some cheap movie? That's the price of one's soul? The devil has gotten a bargain. Divide and Conquer
dangle the carrot of benefits and privileges, and see how easy it is for the pitchforks to come out again. The populace at this point does not choose freedom. They in fact demand their own enslavement. So, the suggestion for everyone is to do what the heart would do. Find each other and legitimately work together. Not as a set of words or as an idealized notion, but to earnestly do so. The very action of it, this very moment. It seems quite obvious that many of us who really see that there is something wrong in this world have somehow been scattered upon the face of it, all separated from each other as if by design. In the most difficult times, we must not leave our fellow brothers and sisters to stand by themselves. No one should have to feel that they are alone and damned by the consequences of doing what they know to be correct. When we help each other, we help ourselves. And it should always be done without the need for profit or compensation. In love, there is no profit. In love, there is no isolated advantage. The ways of the world have twisted this word love into a corrupt formation of what it truly means, which is why there is such a hesitation in its use. But without the comprehension of it, we remain forever lost. These works have always come from that deep place within, and they are done freely because in love there is only freedom. There can never be conditions. Look at nature as the perfect example. She gives everything and expects nothing in return. The paradox is complete. If each of us followed but an iota of her example, there would be a paradigm shift of unimaginable proportions. So, it is wished that each of these efforts has done some good. And if they have not, that has not been the intention, and it has not been from any ill intent. I feel the pain of the heart, and it has been my companion. She speaks of a day when there is no more suffering. That is what I trust. That's what all of these efforts are put towards.